Welcome to Arthritis Wellness Conversations, where we explore the real life, day-to-day experiences of people living with arthritis. On each episode, I'll be joined by a researcher or scientist from Arthritis Research Canada and members of the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. We hope you'll enjoy hearing from our panel and that you'll gain insights and inspiration from individuals that are just like you, living with arthritis. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Arthritis Wellness Conversation. My name is Sandra Sova and today we are joined um, by members of the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. Joining us today are John, Nikki, Allison, Sadiq, Chris, Samantha, Eileen, and Trish. The topic for today's discussion is one that I'm really excited to get uh, to get going on because it's so important and it's something that I've recently embraced over the last couple of years and that is exercise. So on this arthritis wellness conversation, we're going to be talking about how does exercise look for someone who is living with arthritis and we're also going to be joined, we're joined with Dr. Linda Lee, who is going to be talking to us about some of the research that is taking place with regards to technology and how that can come into the picture of arthritis. So of those that are joining us here today, does everyone do some form of regular exercise? I'm seeing a lot of head nodding. John? Yeah. What do you do for your exercise? Well, actually, I'm able to keep uh, my psoriatic arthritis pretty much at bay by doing exercise. And it's it's one of those things where if I don't get a chance to do my daily routine, I can feel it starting to kind of well up. So I have a 50-minute routine that I do when I roll out of bed. Because when I get up, I feel kind of stiff and uh, you know lots of uh, pain here and there and so I, I go through these sort of uh, 15 reps of 17 different exercises that's every day sort of 20, you know seven seven days a week and then i try to uh, walk a, a bit during the week usually you end up with uh, probably 12 to 15 kilometers of walking and then on top of that, I play three rounds of golf, which is around nine kilometers around. So that's another 27 kilometers of walking. I have to swing quite a bit because I'm a lousy golf. Well, that sounds been, like you, you stay quite active. That's, uh, that, that's really good. Have, has anyone recently developed a habit of exercise that they weren't doing before their arthritis. Allison? I have. Um, so normally I work in an office I, as, at a game studio. And so uh, since the we've been working from home for the past three months, it's about March 12th, I have made it my goals every day to hit 10,000 steps. Um, and so it's pretty, so I have a dog and he makes it a lot easier and then I will uh, go for a morning walk every morning for about an hour before I start work at nine. And then generally like a 20 to 30 minute walk after work as well, which has been really great. It's because I had rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. I sort of did a mind, mind switch when I started to want to strengthen my, my need to avoid knee replacement. And now since the last two years, I do daily exercise and it's unbelievable how much that helps. Uh, Before my diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis five years ago, I never consistently exercised. I wanted to, but I didn't really know how. I didn't really know why it was hurting, why I would be so tired after, because it took a long time for me to actually get diagnosed with RA. Um, But rheumatoid arthritis kind of gave me that push that I really needed to sort of take more care of my body and learn how to exercise. And I'm actually really grateful for all that arthritis research has Uh, Canada has taught me about exercise with arthritis. I like how you said learn how to exercise. 
because that is um, that's 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 important, right? Especially if it's going to be going to be an ongoing habit. I've modified my activities. I used to be a very avid athlete and downhill skiing, tennis, and doing a lot of golfing. But um, I've had to modify over the last five or six years, and um, basically walking in deep water swimming or deep water running. Um, so I've had to modify the intensity, sometimes the duration. I've also had to modify sometimes the time of day. So I found that morning is when I have less pain and less fatigue. And so I'm a little bit more successful with completing my activities those days. But if I wait till later in the day, I sometimes uh, aren't able to, or I don't feel like I could exercise as much. So time of day I've had to modify and then also to the activities. Dr. Linda Lee, I thought I'd, uh, I'd ask about modifying and learning to exercise from a basis of someone that does have arthritic uh, activity in their joints. Is that something that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we, when you're trying something new, you need to practice and, you know, sometimes trying, you know, different things and make sure that you're, you're, you're able to do it um, without hurting your joint. So, so I completely understand the, um, you know, the, the experiences that's being shared that people talk about. They have to learn to uh, exercise. And, and what it really means is that learning to, um, to, to try and now, you know, something new and be able to listen to your body and whether, you know, it, it is, you know, right for you to do or not. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, when you're trying something new, of course, the muscle gets a little bit achy uh, because it's still adapting, you know, to the new activities. And at the same time, um, you also want to, get, you know, get a sense of whether the exercise is hurting um, or, or um, too much, uh, giving too much pressure or um, uh, to the joint. So it, it's you know sort of a little bit of trial and error and learning how to um, do the exercises and doing it correctly and, and and also giving the chance for the body to you know sort of adapt to the kind of activity is is very important. So um, oftentimes people may have to start a little bit slowly. Uh, I recommend that people track their symptoms as they start um, doing something new. So I heard the story, uh, uh, the uh, comment that Allison was mentioning that, um, you know, knowing that you are able to do 10,000 steps and um, probably using something to track your uh, number of steps. And, and, and it probably takes a while, you know, for you to build up to, um, to, to be able to do 10,000 steps. So this whole process of, you know, starting slow, trying it out, tracking how much you're able to do in relation to how you feel, um, the day of exercise, and, you know, maybe two, three days after, it gives you a good indication of, you know, whether you're doing sufficiently or you're, you know, doing maybe too little, you can push a little bit more, or maybe you're doing too much that you need to back off a bit. I go a little slower. I do things that work for for me for that to modify and and really listening listening to our our body and knowing what we can do and some days um it's going to be it's going to be different can i add one more thing mm -hmm. i'm just reflecting on trisha's comment about um knowing when is the best time um for for trish um you know you mentioned that um, early morning is the best time for you to do exercise and sometimes it I, I got this question quite a bit that, you know, when is the best time to exercise? And I always tell people that, you know, the time when you feel that you have the most energy is probably the best time for you to do your exercise and you because you're able to focus better and, and, and you know, sort of um, do a little bit more um, without getting tired so easily. So, so that's part of the learning as well that, you know, when is the best time to, to exercise? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Has anybody ever had any hesitation for exercise that they were doing, being concerned that they would cause any joint damage? I actually did in the beginning um, until I started working with a personal trainer. Um, so I was working with a personal trainer only because I was preparing for my wedding and I wanted to do some weightlifting at the time. But she helped me kind of understand how to position my body in a way that's not going to impact my joints. And then now going forward, I actually go to a few workout classes. Well, this is pre-COVID, um, such as group power that 
kind of guides you along on how not to damage your joints. And then if I have a question saying, oh, hey, today my arm is, or my elbow or something's hurting, they help me find ways to modify. So I really, I like that. Um, but yes, in the beginning, it was, I was reluctant to almost do weightlifting just because some days I was so worn out from it. You're making that work for you. Yeah, actually I do a bunch of activities and it really depends on the season. So in the winter, there's been times um, that I'm able to ski and then on the next year, I probably can't. It's, it's all varying. And then same thing, if I'm having a high inflammation day, instead of doing weightlifting, I'll go for a swim. So I try and just find different activities that will work with my body. I'll just listen to it. Um, yesterday it was raining horrendously. My body was super achy. And so instead of doing any kind of exercise, I just opted out for stretching. Perfect. I think also adding to that last point, the type of pain that you have when you're doing weightlifting is really important to keep track of. Um, being a professional golfer, I have pretty active weightlifting sessions uh, two to three times a week in addition to a, an active rehab and physiotherapy routine. And I've been lucky enough to work with my physiotherapist who has taught me what is quote unquote good pain and quote unquote bad pain. Uh, pain that you know is working the respective muscle that you're trying to and pain that is you know, potentially damaging or that would give you a signal to say, okay, I need to stop and I need to modify it or move on to the next one. Yeah, I would echo both Nikki and Sadiq's comments. You know, it's a constant adaptation, finding one thing that's going to work for you forever. It's potentially finding multiple activities that you can do in moderation and together they add up to something really great. Um, and the other thing, in addition to choosing the time of day when you might have the most energy, is setting yourself up for success with the proper nutrition and sleep as well so that you're you're set up for success in your exercise routine um, and you're not going into it already fatigued or hungry or something else that might stop it from being quite as effective and hearing the things like routine and you know setting yourself up for success samantha i like that chris yeah i can agree with uh, you know having a to modify the activities and, and there was a couple activities that i did before uh, I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis and I, I did a lot of running and unfortunately I could never get back into that because it always seemed to flare up my feet. Uh, so I had to uh, go into more uh, low impact exercises. I always love cycling and I can still do cycling and I took up swimming and swimming really is a great low impact uh, cardio workout that I really enjoy. So um, yeah, I've, I've always been worried about getting back into running though. I've had problems trying to do that again, uh, just because of the impact, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. um, just the, uh, and a comment on the the time of day for me, I uh, I feel like a the, the rusty tin man from Wizard of Oz, right? The the less I the less I move, then the stiffer I get. So the mornings I'm always the stiffest, and I have to start with stretching and and kind of push through it. And and the sooner I do that, the the sooner I get moving, the the better I feel. Yeah, so one of the modifications that I made when I am not particularly feeling very well, but I want to exercise is I will break up my exercises throughout the day. So may, you don't necessarily have to do all 30 minutes of walking. So if I'm having a really bad day and I know that I'm going to need to move my joints around a couple times, I'm going to do maybe a 15, 20 minute walk, have a rest and then do another 15, 20 minute walks a couple hours later or so that my body's not using up all the energy at once if I know that I'm having a bad day but some days I'm fine I can do everything all at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested to to know if anyone is using any sort of technology or anything to track and to maybe share a little bit about what might be out might be out there. I see what what was I do I see oh I see a couple of Fitbits is that what I'm seeing? <laughs> Talk to, talk to me about those, those of you that have, uh, that are using that. Let's talk about the technology. No, 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 go um, uh, luckily, I started off one of the studies with Linda Lee, um, using the Fitbit to track my uh, steps with the 
uh, with the Fitbit and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So what I found was really beneficial with that one, it was also kind of around the same time when I was starting new medications. So I could see based off of, uh, how many steps I was able to do in a day. And as that started to grow, that my medication was starting to work and that I was getting stronger and that my sleep was getting better. And so whenever I feel like I'm falling off of uh, my routine, I always set back to doing those, okay, let's see how many steps I get. Let's see the improvement it has on my sleep. And it helps me kind of target my health now. And I keep going back to it. For me, I got introduced to the Fitbit through one of the Arthritis Research Canada studies uh, on Fitbit with Dr. Linda Lee. And I'm actually, I think that was about four or five years ago, and I'm still using the Fitbit because I found it was a good motivator for me. Sometimes you feel like you can bail on yourself because um, you're tired or you've got joint pain or joint stiffness. Um, but the Fitbit actually helps me just keep me accountable and keep me moving along. And I found that's something, it's something very simple, but um, it's, uh, it's my buddy. I find that I just don't like to lose. So if I, and I always consider that if I don't hit my step goal for the day, then it's a loss against myself. So it just helps me just actually get moving because it yells at me too. If that's, if I've been sitting for too long, I'm really bad at, mine tracks like the active hours too, which I really don't ever listen too because so normally I like don't get any steps during but it's it's been really good to get me out and get me moved. Yeah I think that positive reinforcement that it gives you when you get to 10,000 steps or whatever your goal is on the the Fitbit is really rewarding you know it's it's strange but of course we know that positive reinforcement is a really uh, motivating thing and uh, it also helps disrupt that potentially negative feedback loop you know if you're not getting exercise you start to get stiffen up then you're in more pain. You don't feel like you can exercise. And it's important to disrupt that. I think that the positive reinforcement that the Fitbit um, gives is, is much more powerful than I thought it would be when I started Linda Lee's study. Um, I exercise a lot regardless. And so I wasn't expecting for my um, activity to increase. But I did find that that positive reinforcement actually did help me to increase even further beyond what I normally do. Huge fan of the Fitbit as well. I use it a lot over the past couple of years. And then more recently, I moved to a different device called the Whoop. Um, the Whoop was designed more so to predict your body's ability to recover um, through, um, you know, a full day's uh, worth of activity. And so it'll use similar um, markers that the Fitbit and other uh, devices use, but will focus more on your body's ability to recover. And that has helped me tremendously in figuring out how much I can push myself on a daily basis. There'll be times when I think that I've woken up with a good night's sleep and it's told me, hey, you know what? You didn't actually get a good night's sleep. I was feeling a little bit stiff and perhaps my body's recovery percentage was under 50%. And so I, I know then, you know what? I have to take it a little bit easier today. And vice versa, when, you know, I sometimes I'm maybe just feeling lazy, but the whoop will tell me, no, your body's ability to recover is in the 80 to 85% range. You should go at it and do a full workout or day's worth of activity or whatnot. Oh, I like that. I like hearing how technology can can be integrated to to help us with these things. Um, Linda, there's been people have mentioned uh, the study that you're um, that you've been involved in, and that is specifically for tracking activity and or does it go to symptoms as well? Yeah. So um, the program that we were testing basically integrates the use of the Fitbit. We also develop an app so that um, it visualize the Fitbit um, track data in a more um, comprehensive way. Um, and another thing is that we pair up uh, individuals with a physiotherapist so that you actually can work together to set small goals um, and work through the process of how to do that. Some of the earlier um, comments from, from everyone that, you know, talking about um, learning how to exercise and trying it out, and it's in essence, we're really trying to, you know, make it into smaller steps in a way that, you know, you can, uh, you know, develop some of the goals in achieving it and so that, you know, success builds success um, sort of thing. So that's where the, um, the counseling component 
um, you know, uh, it is um, helpful. And I think um, I, I, I was really pleased to hear uh, some of the comments around um, using Fitbit, you know, as a motivational tool. Um, and I'm particularly happy to hear Sadiq's comment about using um, you know, Fitbit or using uh, activity trackers as a way to learn more about yourself, that how fast you can recover, how hard you can push. And so in our earlier work, we tend to use, um, you know, Fitbit and, and these type of devices as a motivational tool. But some of our more recent projects, we are trying to leverage the motivational component into um, something bigger, that we are um, helping people to, you know, basically look at the data of how they, how active they are, compared with how much symptoms that they feel throughout the day, so that you can actually get a better sense of how much I can push myself, how fast we, how fast I recover from trying something new, um, and most importantly, is there any signal that may indicate that I'm, I'm having a flare up, which means that I should go back to check with my rheumatologist and look at, you know, perhaps adjusting medication. So, um, you know, in a sense, these type of tools gives a lot of data, which only you can give. And that's sort of the power of working with technology that not only that it motivates you, but it helps you to learn more about you so that you can make better decisions about managing your health. I think that's really empowering. And, you know, with it, with, with exercise, it's often, it's, it's a mind, it's a mind and body. So that can sort of be the, the litmus test. Do you have any devices that you wear for supporting your joints while exercising? Chris? Uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things. Like I mentioned before, I have a lot of problems with my feet and, and uh, just arch support supports are, are really important, I find. Um, uh, but probably the, probably the one of the biggest uh, I found, I, I like to do a lot of cycling. And when I got back into cycling after my initial diagnosis, I had uh, a lot of trouble putting the weight on my wrists. And especially when you're biking, you get some vibration through your wrists. So I, uh, I bought myself a set of arrow bars, uh, the, the bars that kind of stick up in, in front of the handlebars uh, that you can rest on your forearms. And that made a world of difference because I can... Uh, you know, uh, avoid avoid uh, putting the strain on my joints, but still give my muscles an exercise. And then for me, I've uh, done the same thing. I got custom foot orthotics, um, as well as I've really invested into good walking shoes. I have difficulty with balance. Um, and I also went and got walking poles. And I find that that's made a huge difference because then I'm feeling more confident. I'm not worried about falling. And then also too is I'm actually getting a little bit of better cardio and I'm using my upper body, not just my lower legs. So I found good walking shoes, the foot orthotics and the walking poles has helped me. I found for me, what was a bit of a struggle, just kind of having, I was diagnosed at three and then um, I had really, my feet are really affected. And so for me, what was a big shift, which made a big difference was realizing that just even if I wasn't doing physical activity, the shoes I was wearing was important. So like if I was going out or if I was meeting friends or something like that, then it was really important that I wear shoes that supported that and that had my orthotics in them or that had a proper arch support. Otherwise I would be in pain for the next couple of days. And so that was a big shift. Um, and once I've done that, it's been a, made a huge difference. Yeah, I got into the uh, foot orthotics a number of years ago and a metatarsal arch uh, collapsed on me. And then recently they were talking about uh, wedging these uh, orthotics so that your knees don't seem to be affected as much. So the latest uh, batch of orthotics that I, I had uh, from Kintec, that's what they did. They, they put a... a a three degree wedge in on, on both orthotics. And I, I don't know whether it's factual or not, but I at least uh, feel like my knees are better off because of that. And certainly my metatarsal arch has never been a problem. But I could not get along with those orthotics. <clears throat> when it comes to the area of research and what's taking place at Arthritis Research Canada, Doctor, the overall importance of being exercising and remaining um, active? Yeah, um, you know, if there is a pill 
that is good for everything um, for people with arthritis or, or any type of chronic conditions. I would say that it's called exercise. Um, you know, lots of um, wonderful benefits. Um, you know, when people are um, physically active or maintaining um, an exercise routine, um, in general, people's blood pressure tends to be, uh, you know, a better regulator. Your blood sugar is better regulated, so um, you know it, it is a good um, uh, way to prevent or um, if someone has diabetes. Um, that it, that is um, you know certainly a good thing to do. Um, people with um, inflammatory uh, arthritis, in particular, do have a higher risk of um, heart uh, disease, cardiovascular uh, conditions. Exercise, of course, we know very well that is um, a, a good way to reduce the risk of cardiovascular um, events. And of course, people who are physically active, your mood is better. So um, it's good for uh, you know managing uh, if people feel anxious or you know um, uh, uh, preventing de depression. That is a good thing. People who are physically active, you sleep better. So it also has a way to um, you know indirectly help to manage fatigue. Um, and one thing is particularly important for people with inflammatory arthritis is that when people maintain regular physical activity, your inflammatory level, so the cells and the enzymes related to inflammation, actually are lower as compared to people who live a more sedentary lifestyle. So um, and just to sum up, exercise basically covers all the important things that people with arthritis can benefit from. So. It, it, uh, it, it's certainly an amazing thing to, um, to do. And also I'll add that having a healthier body weight can also be extremely um, helpful for, uh, for people with, um, with arthritis. I talked about being able to sleep better and helping with the fatigue. Raise your hand if you find that being active and exercising actually increases your energy. Like it's like a right okay so anyone watching this anyone who has any sort of arthritis and you're thinking that you can't possibly be exercising because of discomfort or energy you just had every single person right here tell you with sincerity that it does it does make a difference it improves it improves all of, it's like it's like linda said it's like if there was a one size fit all magic um, magic pill we should be taking it's the natural uh, one called exercise Actually, uh, Sandra, Linda's comment about exercise being the pill, I've actually noticed recently that uh, normally I would take Tylenol to, you know, cover up pain and so on. And I've noticed recently that I actually am using exercise to move the pain back instead of taking Tylenol. So her comment about the pill is, is right on. <laughs> Exercise also helps with cognitive dysfunction, which does not get talked uh, enough about when living with rheumatoid arthritis, I find. Absolutely. Um, help with the brain fog, which we yeah. are often refer to. And also it can be a real, a way to work through if you've got some, instead of keeping, you know, emotions inside, go and work those out by with a good walk or on the elliptical. Chris, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I agree very much with John. That it's, uh, it, it's quite literally like a pill. Like uh, uh, you've heard of the, the runner's high before, where it's literally this uh, feel-good feeling at the end of the workout, especially if you push yourself enough. And, and uh, it actually does relieve pain. Like I, I feel less pain, uh, of course, as long as I don't push myself too hard and cause an injury. But, <laughs> but uh, it definitely uh, uh, helps with the pain. I also, yeah, and I think that our exercise gives us something to do about this, this lifelong disease that we're facing. You know, it's not going anywhere. I personally am going to live with this, dec this for decades, right? Um, but exercise empowers me. It, it gives me something that I can do to help myself and to take control of certain parts of my life that this disease you know, otherwise might take over. So it's, it's kind of what empowers me um, to, live, to live well with arthritis, not just to survive with arthritis. Yeah, I felt the same way at an end of a bike ride so many times where I, I, I 
achieve my goal on the bike ride and it's like a victory over arthritis. One of the, the things that I uh, phrase I often use is uh, trying to empower people to be in the driver's seat when it comes to, uh, to our health because there is so much with arthritis that is unpredictable, that it is out of our control. And, but at the end of the day, what we can control and influence and something like that and something so positive as, as exercise, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real big, I'm a real big fan. What are some of the, maybe some of the challenges? Are there things that you wish that you could do? Or does anyone have a, a, a goal that they're trying to uh, try something new? I've had uh, problems with my knees over the years, and uh, I, I always thought that running was something I stay away from. And recently, I've actually started to uh, try to run, and it's a, it's a really interesting uh, experience for me because if I go out about it properly, I'm, I am actually making progress, and I'm I'm actually starting to believe that it, it's helping my knees. It's 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 very slow, like I've been doing this for a year and I'm still not really running in the true sense of the word but and that's one of the things that people haven't talked about with exercise is that you know I, I guess Linda was talking about it earlier about how you have to be careful when you're changing exercises and so on but uh, Eileen's comment about the cognitive part one of the things that that I've noticed is that if you get involved with things that require using the brain and the physical uh, aspect of things at the same time, that is really powerful. It's one of the things that I really like about golf is that it's got a certain amount of exercise involved, but it also uses the old gray cells, which is a, a lot of mental aspects of golf. You know, when you're tired and so on, you know, pushing through and keeping the mental focus is, is also a part of the game. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so I w don't want to lose the um, conversation around exercise and uh, cognitive function. And thanks, Eileen and, and John, for bringing that up. Um, there is new and exciting evidence that you know came out probably around the last uh, five years or so, actually from um, uh, from UBC, that uh, looking at the benefits of strength training in normal aging. So we all age, let's face it. So when we age, our brain's supposed to shrink. And that's why, you know, when we get older, um, your cognitive function, your um, ability to rem remember things and, um, and, and make decisions goes down. So it's, there is now really good evidence suggesting that when we do strength training, um, as well as cardio um, exercise, it helps to slow down the straight, the shrinkage of um, of the brain uh, uh, material. So um, you know, so it is important that you know, um, with our, especially for people with arthritis, we talk about you know um, the the cognitive impact uh, of the disease, and so strength training, cardio uh, exercise, um, you know, those are all very good activities to engage in, um, not only for bone and joint health, but most importantly for cognitive health. And you can actually, uh, it, it helps to mitigate some of the uh, effects from normal aging. Also, there's uh, um, the aspect of bone health, osteoporosis uh, for women in, in particular, and um, weight training is said to help for that. What With someone with arthritis, is there should they go and consult with a rheumatologist, a physiotherapist, or where should someone get some guidance before undertaking something new? Well, I, vote, I vote for a physiotherapist. <laughs> well, all of my exercise routine is uh, a, a bunch of exercises uh, recommended over the years by different physiotherapists. And it, you know, like one of the big problems I've had is if you have surgery, like I had a my uh, prostate out and I, I had a you know a hernia and then I had my gallbladder out. Well every time you have a surgery like that you have to go through about a six month to three month or six weeks to three month period where you're not really allowed to do anything. And that is actually one of the toughest aspects when you've got an inflammatory disease to go through 
six weeks of relative inactivity where you've got to phase back into it slowly. Yeah, I found that to be a tremendously difficult thing to go through. And uh, over a lifetime, you're going to experience those periods when you cannot do things. You have to back off. And then you've got to get back into the program. First, it's just very difficult. Yeah. Well, I've been living with osteoarthritis for close to 30 years. And in the first several years, I kind of did my own program and my own things. And then I started to have more and more difficulty. And I started going to the Mary Packer Arthritis Program and seeing physiotherapists and seeing how I could modify my activities and still stay active. And then there was a point that my joints were deteriorating um, and I wanted to be closer to 65 when I had my knee replacement and I was in my 40s at the time. So we were doing everything conservatively to help me keep the joint I had without it progressing as quickly as it was. And I think that was really important, building the quad strength, the muscles around the joint um, and keeping the joint stable. And as I said earlier, the foot orthotics. But I think what I did prior exercises with the physiotherapist before my knee replacement is different than what I can do now. And everything has kind of been modified and changed. So your exercises, whether they're strength, um, flexibility, range of motion, um, cardio, um, they have to be all able to be adaptable to where you are in your disease and also to is, uh, flare ups as well. So um, yeah, because the things I do now with my physiotherapist are different than I did prior to my knee replacement. One of the exercises that you didn't mention, Trish, is balance. Everybody has to practice balance. That's, that's good for balance, but it's also good for your mental acuity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a uh, 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 air filled, um, it's kind of a sisal, and I stand on it every morning and I just kind of do one leg, two legs, and I just kind of go back and forth. And that's actually, and sometimes I f fall over and I put my arms out like a ballerina. But other times, um, I am actually pretty good with the balance. But if I don't do those exercises, I notice a difference. You know, if I don't do them after a couple of days, um, I start to have some issues climbing stairs or... Um, use it or lose it. Yeah, move it, move it or lose it. Move it or lose it or use it lose it, yeah. Yeah. Sadiq? I think I would also uh, echo a lot of what John said favoring the physiotherapy route at something that I uh, just in the past five years has allowed me to, you know, take my shot at getting onto the PGA tour. But I do think that it takes a village and all the resources that you can get your hands on, whether that be a physiotherapist and your rheumatologist and, you know, other physicians you're seeing or other nutritionists or whoever else that adds to your team. But at the end of the day, the team is there to try to help you. And so at least in my case, whenever, something changes, I'd be sure to let everybody who is trying to help me know that, hey, this is what's happening and that they can adjust accordingly. The most recent example being I was getting ready to play in a qualifier for the PGA Tour of Canada. And unfortunately with COVID that got canceled, but with that comes different amounts of training on and off the golf course. And then my rheumatologist and I will adjust my medication regimen based on how much more intense the training is and where that's happening. Um, and so it's important to just make sure that everybody is kept in the loop on what you're doing. I think the, the team approach is definitely the way to go. And as much as I love physiotherapy, um, I'm married to a physiotherapist, so I'm biased there. <laughs> I want to support another type of um, therapy and that's occupational therapy and I, we cannot underestimate the power of uh, occupational therapy in helping to provide um, alternative ways to to do uh, certain activities and um, yeah I think that a lot of people don't seek the, the help of an occupational therapist when they have arthritis but uh, it can be extremely helpful not just for your career and adaptations for you to work but also adaptations for you to exercise. So as we're having this conversation with, yes, Linda. Sorry, um, since nobody mentioned it, I, I, I just also want to um, mention that, you know, it, it, physios and occupational therapists are wonderful, but uh, I agree with Sadiq that it takes a village and um, they're a very important player in the wellness sector would be um, fitness trainers and kinesiologists. Um, oftentimes, um, 
you know, it, it, it depends on where people live. Uh, it may or may not be easy to access a physiotherapist or occupational therapist to um, work on their exercise or their um, physical activities, but most of the places you w would be able to have some access to, um, you know, community center or um, a gym, a local gym where you can find, um, you know, kinesiologists and uh, fitness trainer. Um, and I think the key is that uh, when people work with these um, wellness professionals, ask the question, how much experience do you have working with someone who have a condition like my own, uh, so that you can get a sense whether this person has the, um, the knowledge and skills to be able to work with you to develop your exercise program. But again, it takes a village and, you know, um, and lots of people can help. The thing you have to remember is that you personally are the mayor of the village. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, we we make the bylaws. We're the we're the ones that are ultimately in charge for sure. Well, as people are listening to us have this arthritis wellness conversation, again, today's topic has been exercise and navigating that as a person who's living with arthritis. I'd just like to give the opportunity for everyone to share Something additional that may be on their on their mind or on their heart to either share a story or to you know, encourage people about what's possible with exercise. Just uh, jump in. I'd love to hear from the panel. Strength train before you do your cardio. That's one of the biggest <laughs> lessons I learned. <laughs> For me, it was a variety of exercises. Um, if I did too many days in a row walking, I would find it would be detrimental. So what I had to do is figure out a balance between the pool, walking. I also go to a personal trainer. Um, so I've had to figure out certain days what works best for me. So I find a variety of activities, not just the same activity, um, has been really beneficial for me. You know, I've run into a lot of people who say they don't have time to do exercise. And the real answer to the equation is you have to organize your lifestyle to fit your exercise not the other way around. It's, you got to make time for it. It's incredibly important. Well, put it on your calendar. <laughs> I would say it's okay to compete with yourself, but don't compare the progress you're making to other people. Because it's, we are all different and we're going to move at different paces. And so to, well, the sooner you, you accept that, the easier it is to make the progress you want to see. I agree a lot with John about uh, making, making the time to get the exercise and uh, myself, I have three kids at home and, and uh, I love to bike and uh, I most often I'm biking to work. That's the only time I can get fitted in. And I think a big part of that success for me has been making it um, a regular routine. Uh, if I'm doing it every day, it's a habit and uh, it becomes part of the lifestyle. So I think uh, that really keeps me going. And I just want to add one more piece of equipment that I forgot to mention earlier, I have a standing desk at work. So that's that's another nice option where I can stand up for, for an hour, sit down for an hour and mm -hmm. keep moving that way as well. I think there's a lot of trial and error that occurs with people with autoimmune conditions and more specifically with arthritis, you know, whether that is finding a medication regimen that keeps the condition under control, finding your activity buffer that puts you in your optimal level. Um, and you know, as we're on this topic of it takes a village, that also includes your colleagues and your friends that you make that go through similar adversities. And so even just joining the, the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board, I've met people who I can connect with a lot more when it comes to these kind of things. And I would encourage everybody to reach out and open up and you know, share your story and see how other people can help and inspire you to do a better job of managing your condition. Yeah, and one thing I want to highlight for folks that are in underserved communities, because um, my mind is particularly with them um, not having access to the types of therapies we might have in urban settings, is that if there's one thing that COVID's done for us, it's advanced um, a lot of the telehealth uh, uh, thing, sorry, uh, things that are available to us via telehealth. And so COVID's taught us that a lot is possible through a virtual connection. So now might be the opportunity to reach out to practitioners that might not be within your own community 
but might be elsewhere to see if they can help you via telehealth or a different type of virtual connection. I know I'll share a tip for anyone who is thinking of starting working out in um, a gym with a facility. I know I always had problems walking outside because of balance and uneven surfaces. And so then I started on the treadmill at the gym. I found that the discomfort in my knee was really alleviated if I would put it up on a slight incline. But having those rails and having that surface gave me the confidence that I knew I wasn't going to fall. And I also think it's really important to have a really good playlist when you're trying to, trying to move. That's another, another one of my top tips. Find time, make a plan, check back on your plan. Um, don't make a plan that it, you know, it, it set you up for failure. Um, and, and, and make sure that um, you find a way to track how you're doing. Um, I, I cannot stress enough that, you know, we all have our own data and we're the best keeper of that data. And so use that to inform, you know, how hard, how much, how fast, you know, you can um, make progression or modification to your exercise like you you know and it also helps you when you work with your physio your rheumatologist other health professionals when you're modifying program because they rely on your data to give you the best advice i know there's, there's a lot of love for the fitbit but uh, i just want to make the point too that if you don't have access to that kind of technology just a simple log or a simple journal is a great way to get that data too i, I remember keeping a, a journal for myself and and uh, it's another nice way to see those trends like over the weeks and months and, and see how you've improved. And I think with that also, I want to reiterate Allison's point about competing with yourself and knowing your buffer zone. Uh, like you said, it's definitely great to push yourself and, uh, you know, set goals that are reasonable for you, but be sure not to take that outside so much that you're comparing to other people and, pushing yourself beyond your limits. Absolutely. I think those are really, really great points. I think this has been a really excellent conversation. I would like to thank everyone for their participation today. I hope that the listeners and viewers have found this information informative, educational, and inspiring so that we can all be in the driver's seat when it comes to our health and wellness. Thanks again for joining us and thanks to Arthritis Research Canada. This has been Arthritis Wellness Conversations and we will We'll see you next time. For more information, please visit arthritisresearch.ca. And if you'd like to join the conversation, search for Arthritis Wellness Conversations on YouTube and leave a comment. This is Sandra Sova, wishing you wellness.